Um, I'll just go ahead and um, give a short introduction um, for us to get to know our speakers uh, a little bit better as we have more people here joining and then we're really excited um, to hear from them. Um, today we actually um, will have two presenters um, which we're really excited and grateful about. Um, so um, we will actually hear from Dr. Julia um, Gosser today. Um, she's an assistant professor of history um, uh, and she's also a distinguished assistant professor of honors um, education. Um, so we are really excited to have her. Um, she actually teaches at USU um, a variety of courses on European and Atlantic history and her primary research is on the history of childhood and youth in early modern France. Um, Dr. Gossard has also published on the use of timeliness, um, Google Maps and role play games in her classroom. So that will be a really exciting insight that we'll get here. And um, together with um, Dr. Gossard, we'll have Dr. Chris Babbitts um, present with her. Um, he's a, a postdoctoral teaching fellow um, in the Department of History here at USU. He um, specializes in the history of the United States. Um, with research um, in different areas, including gender and sexuality, psychology, religion, um, and he has also written um, about historical thinking and um, pedagogy for teaching U.S. history and process. Um, so he actually has a blog for American history, which is going to be really exciting. Um, today, um, those two presenters will present on creating collaborative timelines, study guides, digital exhibits, um, and also storyboards. And the insights they provide will be applicable to any discipline. So please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Gossard and Dr. Babbitts here for our presentation. Um, if you have any questions along the presentation, please feel free to um, just drop your questions in the chat um, here in Zoom and we'll make sure to get to them um, in our Q&A after the presentation. Um, yes, welcome Julia and Chris. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and share our PowerPoint that we have going at the moment. Let's see. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm Dr. Julia Gossard. I will be joined by uh, Dr. Chris Babbitts, and we're gonna be telling you about Timeline JS. This is a tool that both Chris and I um, have used a number of times in our classes in a variety of different ways. And we wanted to share this with all of you, especially those of you who maybe are looking for something of how to get your students to work collaboratively together on a variety of different topics. You can see an example here from actually one of Chris's uses of this with um, an American Indian history that he assisted with uh, in making this timeline. So we're gonna look at some of those ideas together. Before we get started, neither Chris or I created Timeline JS. This is actually from Night Lab, which is a uh, student run laboratory at Northwestern University where they create these digital tools for teaching and learning. So we didn't help make this, but we have used it and we can uh, show you some of the ways that we're going to use this. So today you can see our session agenda there. We're gonna uh, go into a little bit more detail what Timeline JS is um, on the next slide. Also how we've used Timeline JS in the classroom and Julia is really going to go into technical details, how to really use it. Um, and then we'll end with uh, more ideas on how to use not only Timeline JS, but some of the other Night Lab tools that, and, and programs that they've set up. All right, so what is Timeline JS? As I'm presenting, you might find it helpful to actually navigate yourself to timeline.nightlab.com. And this is the landing site for Timeline JS, and they walk you through exactly how to set up a timeline and what it is. But essentially, Timeline JS is a free open source tool that allows your classroom to make collaborative, very visually stunning timelines. They're very traditional timelines that run on years, although we can talk about ways that you can manipulate it that if you don't have an assignment or a presentation that you want tied to specific years, you can do that too. 
it is a very easy to use resource. They have plenty of instructions that are provided for both instructors as well as students to understand how to use this resource. And it is something that if you are interested in working with a timeline, I would say this is a very entry level application to use. Um, it really has a large community of people who are using it, lots of resources available about it. I think it's one of the easiest entry points. I've used a number of other tools, um, including things like Cleovis. Uh, there's also Timeline Creator. Some of those are a little bit more complicated. I have found this the easiest for me to use and the easiest for my students to use. And one of the reasons for that is because it uses Google Sheets. Um, so really the back round of this is based on a Google Sheet that then gets uploaded to the Timeline.js website that creates the timeline for you. So there's not a lot of coding that you're going to be doing. It's simply data input into a Google Sheet. Now with that, if you are creative, there are ways um, that you can customize the timeline to look a particular way using CSS configuration. So if you wanted to really customize it, you definitely can. And like I said too, they provide such detailed step-by-step -step instructions, it's very easy. Another thing that I like about Timeline.js is that it does allow iframe integration into Canvas. So in your individual Canvas pages, you can actually HTML code this into an iframe so that it can embed within your classroom. So your students can see their entries being put up immediately in the classroom. They don't have to click anywhere else. It can just be seamlessly embedded there. When we think about Timeline JS in the classroom, obviously one of the things Empowering Teaching Excellence and City have been telling us all summer, if you've been going to some of the trainings, maybe in some of the other conferences that you've been going to, is to think about the outcomes. This is a great tool, but only if it helps you achieve a particular assignment or a particular outcome. So thinking about the learning outcomes that Timeline JS can assist you with, obviously this encourages student collaboration. You can assign this as an individual assignment. I've always assigned it as a group assignment, but regardless of who is doing the actual entries, students have to collaborate with each other in order to make sure that the timeline works together. The other thing is, is that this really emphasizes student-centric knowledge. By allowing your students to take on a piece of this timeline, you're encouraging them to take ownership and to create knowledge as part of your classroom experience. It's that apply of Bloom's taxonomy. You're also teaching them, depending upon your assignment, perhaps digital literacy, especially if they are choosing images off the internet or accessing sources, you're teaching them some digital source evaluation and digital literacy. The other thing that I really like about Timeline.js, that it's very easy to implement peer review. When you have something that is uh, presented as a timeline, easy for everybody to see all of the different um, entry points, you're able to do peer review very easily, which teaches students about that process. And also this teaches students about professional presentation skills. I've used Timeline.js primarily in my general education surveys. Very few of my students are probably going to go on to be professional historians, but they're going to use a lot of the tools that I teach in that class, like critical thinking, or presentation skills in their career. So this gives them an easy entry point to thinking about presentation skills. And to just kind of emphasize uh, what I've done with Timeline.js to give you a little bit of almost a case study here. I've been using Timeline.js in my classroom for the past five years um, with a project called Food in the West. I determined that I wanted my students to do a a research paper, but not in the traditional way. This is in a general education survey. I didn't want them to just write a research paper. I thought, what's a more interesting way that they could access those same skills? And I came up with the idea of having them create a timeline. As you can see here, we have Khrushchev holding a big ear of corn. It's one of my favorite images um, from my course, where students think about the history of food and they tie it back to larger historical narratives. And they do research, they come up with a topic, they have to use a particular number of sources and analyze this. And they do three entries over the course of the semester. 
it's a considerable amount of their grade. It's 20% of their grade. And they can do this in groups or they can do it individually. And this really helps them to understand how history can be applied. It applies their critical thinking skills and it allows them to see their knowledge in one place. I also use this as on exams, I'll usually put an identification term from something that is on the timeline that they would have had to have accessed as well. So it's serving a dual purpose there. So in coming up with this assignment, I thought about how does this fulfill some of my learning objectives? Well, it's teaching them those research skills. It's teaching them source evaluation because I make sure that within this, I have them access at least two secondary sources as well as a primary source, and I make them evaluate them. It's also teaching them concise writing. As you can see on the screen, these aren't excessively long entries. They're about 300 words in total. So they're having to think about how do I effectively and efficiently get my critical thinking and analysis across. This is something I'm sure most academics could work on ourselves is how do we write concisely in a way that is still impactful. It's also teaching them a little bit about project management, um, especially with a group project, writing something, splitting up the responsibilities is really important and gives, gives them a number of skills in presentations that they can split up. Like I said before, it's also giving them a chance to evaluate their peers. There's actually a formal peer evaluation process I go through and professional presentation. I have all of the assignment instructions for this available on a resource that I'll show you later that you can access, you can remix for your own classes if you would like or take inspiration from it. But this is how I've generally used it. Chris, how have you used it in your classes? The first time I used uh, Timeline JS, I was actually a supplemental instructor for American Indian History. And one of the things that we noticed uh, after the midterm was that a lot of the students didn't understand maybe some of the basic historical thinking skills we wanted them to understand, which were, you know, chronology and change over time. So we implemented a Timeline JS assignment for extra credit that uh, help students visualize when and where events happened in American Indian history, which is often not, times, uh, not taught uh, in depth um, before the college level or even in the college surveys often, um, to then use as a crowdsource study guide on the final exam. And what we found were that students perform much better on the final exam because not only had a lot of them created these extra credit uh, timeline entries on, on topics that we were covering, but they got to really visualize that and see it. And that was one of the things that they commented on, not only in my evaluation, but the instructor records evaluation. Yeah, I think that that idea there that they're applying that they're visualizing this can speak to people who learn in a variety of different ways for certain. I think one of the biggest things that using this assignment over the past several years has taught me is that there's also an unintended but very important outcome of using Timeline JS. And that's actually that it teaches your students the Google suite of services. A lot of your students may be familiar with Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Hangouts, but a lot of them aren't. Um, and especially if you're teaching a first year course, this can be a really impactful skill. I had on my evaluations almost every single year, it's like I had no idea that I could use Google Docs and it's fabulous because I can share my work with anybody. It automatically updates it if I'm online so I don't have to worry about my computer crashing or my dog eating my homework. Um, you know, this really is something that it teaches those students too. So that's kind of a hidden skill that this uses as well. Let's get into some of the technical details of how to do this. This is kind of a how-to session. So we wanted to make sure that we go through and we actually show you how to do this. To use Timeline.js, you will need a Google account. Um, it's important to note that students through their aggiemail.usu.edu emails have access to Google Sheets, Google Docs, and a number of other Google services, though not all. So that's something to keep into consideration. And I think though somebody who is more technical with this, that professors can also get an Aggie Mail account if you don't already have a Google account or you don't wanna link it to your own private account as well. Um, you'll also need the Google Sheet template that I'll show you in a moment and the Night Lab instructions. And this may be where you want to 
maybe even minimize Zoom and follow along with me through the nightlab.com, timeline.nightlab.com uh, website if you want to, but I'm actually gonna take you there now. So let me stop my share and start sharing my Firefox. This is great practice for the fall when I'm going to be doing a web broadcast of how I can share everything out. So I'm actually really excited. All right. So when you go to timeline.nightlab.com, this is where you're going to end up is at timeline.js. Again, this is a night lab product. It is run by Northwestern University. They're doing a number of different projects that we'll actually go over at the end but it can be really fun to visit this projects tab and see what students are creating. So the easiest way to get started is to simply click make a timeline and it'll bring you down to their step-by-step -step instructions of how to do this. I'm just gonna quickly scroll through here and you can see it really does give you step-by-step. -step. There's also a help. You can look at their frequently asked questions. Their introductory video is great. Um, and they also have a number of technical documentation here, especially if you are maybe somebody who's a little bit more advanced and wants to do something with JSON or CSS. These are different ways to look at this. You do not need to do that. It is not, I've never done that. So that is not a need. It works perfectly fine and looks very beautiful even without that. And actually, before we start looking at all of these technical details, let's actually look at what this food timeline looks at looks like. So this is an example from, I believe, fall 2019, although it could be 2018. And this is my class's timeline. So this is the landing page here. I created this, you know, a cute little image of different historical figures eating throughout time, feasting in history. And it's just a very easy click through. You can see all of the different entries down here, you can scroll on this, you can scroll through. Everything comes with a visual image. There's always a tagline, there's always a year, as well as the entry. So this is kind of what it looks like. Sometimes you do have an issue where an image may not be there anymore, so that will happen. So you can see it's very easy to navigate. You get into all of these different entries here that start to overlap. It demonstrates to students change over time and lets them easily access this. Really, so getting I, back to, yeah. I, I, it, it seems like a lot of work possibly to get all of this right, but you've used your teaching team in order to make it so that this, this goes seamlessly, right? Absolutely. So one of the things that we'll look at in just a second is the, the spreadsheet template. And this is very easy for students to use, but it can get somewhat um, complicated. So this might be something that would be a great example for, uh, or a great task for a UTF, an undergraduate teaching fellow, or even a teaching assistant to maybe be the point person to make sure everything stays really nicely organized here. So the first thing you're going to do is just simply get the spreadsheet template. When you click this, it'll open up a Google Doc here, and it'll ask you, would you like to make a copy of the official Timeline.js template? You say yes. It's making a copy. It'll bring this out, and it gives you some examples of how to fill out this spreadsheet. The most important thing is, is that the spreadsheet will not work unless you have a year you do not need both a month and a date. You just need the year. That's really almost like the marker that allows the post to post itself. Everything else other than the start year and the end year are really optional. So you have here a headline, which is the title. You have the text. If you want to add media, you can. Media credit, media caption, thumbnail. All of this is optional that you can add. You can also change the background uh, colors and things like that as well. And Julia, I think you have something uh, to the right on the screen that answers Lauren's question about whether in a single timeline, can you make different categories of entries? So things happening in France, Germany, and Italy, all in different colors. 
Absolutely. And that's, that's uh, the group that you have here. So if you wanted something to just be, say, it's only things that are happening in France, you would make sure that that was tagged with group. So there's a great way that you can organize this and customize it to your particular learning needs. So this is the, the template. I'll show you one that I recently did just myself filled out. So this is one filled out that I did, the French Revolution, a timeline. One of the great ways that I think you can start to use this, I, I think a, a big piece of advice is you should know how to use this before assigning it to your students. And a, a good way to do that is use it in a lecture or in a teaching activity and make yourself familiar with what some of the maybe the eccentricities of it are, as well as what's super easy. So I created recently a French Revolution timeline to use in my lecture about the French Revolution. As you can see here, I only have, for most of these entries, the year filled out. Display date means the date that it will display as. It will usually span this on the bottom down here. That's the span date. But if you just want it to display one date, that's what we would put here. And so I just put this all together. So this is what it looks like filled out with sort of just the basics that are there. Um, these can get a little bit unwieldy when students have massive amounts of text, and that might be about making sure that this is not necessarily wrapped text. If you're familiar with using spreadsheets, you might not want to wrap that text. There, you might just want to have it go uh, without wrapping it. So that's what it looks like filled out. Really, I think we can answer some questions too at this sure. point, because Marcus asks, if you don't have a teaching assistant, is it possible manageable? I think oh, that yeah. this spreadsheet shows that it's pretty easy for students to navigate on their own. Um, it, for larger classes, I think a UTF, an undergraduate teaching fellow or teaching assistant, definitely helps out with that. And, and I was very much in that role myself the first time I used this. Um, so, uh, you know, if uh, you are teaching a 40 a person course, so this is very manageable on, on your own. Um, because students can go in, they can upload things, and you can double check as you're clicking through the timeline to make sure that everything uploads right. The first two years that I used this in my uh, survey course, which was, uh, I think, 120 student enrollment, I had them upload it themselves, and there were no problems. There was sometimes, like, they might skip a line or they might accidentally mess something up, but if I checked it and I told them how to fix it, they would immediately fix it. So it's, it can get a little bit unwieldy, but it is definitely something that you can do yourself too. And you can put the responsibility on your students and say, you know, part of your grade is figuring out how this works. There's plenty of documentation that I will provide to you, that Night Lab provides to you, that you can put, in, put this into a spreadsheet and to use. And there's one other question about timeframes. And I'm a 20th century historian, so I don't know the answer to this, but uh, it looks like Evie is in the geosciences and is wondering if uh, you could have timeframes that uh, go back millions or even billions of years. I believe that you can. I believe that the only thing that you do different for that is you, you provide a negative value. So whatever your, your year is, you would provide the negative value. I believe you can do that all the way up to billions of years. If you can't, I bet that Timeline JS would love to hear from you and they could probably add that, that functionality very easily and they would love to see this being used in a non-humanities class. So. And, and one other, other thing is you can create categories for time spans. So one of the nerdiest things I've ever done was I used Timeline JS for my comprehensive exam studying. And so as a historian, there's a period of social his history that was at its height. So I created that time span and that was able to overlap with my book entries I had to read for my exam. So I could see when things were at the high point of social history and then the cultural history turn too. So you can set those up um, so that way students see a period, maybe a geological period, um, and then match events with that too. The other thing you can do too, if you just, you have no interest in associating it with a time at all, that's fine. If you want to use this more as just literally flashcards on a screen to get student engagement, that's a great way to do this. Instead of the year, you could just fill out one, two, three, and number it that way, and it'll show it in that capacity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a year, there just has to be a numeric value associated with it. 
the numeric value can just literally be a numbering system on your end. Are there other questions we can answer at this time? I actually can't see the chat screen, Chris. We have all of them answered that have come in so far. All right. Well, I'm going to go back to the technical details of how to do this. So you get the, the spreadsheet template. So I showed you how to do that. The most important thing that I can tell you about this is this step number two. In order to do this, you have to publish the spreadsheet to the web. This makes it publicly available on the web. I've never had an issue with this. I've never had like somebody mess with it or find it and do something wrong with it. It just makes it so that the functionality for Timeline JS works on the presentation site. So this walks you through how to do that on the Google Sheet itself. And you do not set the Timeline Google Sheet to anyone with the link can edit. Um, you know, don't do that. And it kind of goes through the different steps necessary to do this. After you close that window, you'll have to then go up to your browser bar and actually copy the URL in the browser bar, not what pops up after you publish it to the web. It'll give you a link there, but that's not the one that you use. Then you will type that into this Google spreadsheet URL, which uploads it to the Timeline JS database. And then they will give you your shareable link to now your timeline, which then will look something like this. And that's where you can, I would definitely bookmark this. You can find it again very easily by just going through that same step process again. But this is also where you're going to get the embed HTML code for the iframe for Canvas. So it's sort of a multi-step process. You only have to do that one time. It will automatically update all of the entries that are put on the Google spreadsheet each time that an entry is put in there. So there is nothing that you have to do after these initial four steps on the Timeline JS website. Everything else just comes directly from the Google Sheet update. So we have two questions. Um, one from sure. Jolyn asks about creating interactive graphs that can be used in a Canvas course. We're gonna get to a different tool that they have um, that Night Live has created that we'll get to that. So uh, Jolyn, we will get to your question. And then Duke has asked if we, have any experience with students using this to chronicle their own process of completing a physical building type project. So like a build log for a physical item that they create. We're both historians, so we haven't done that, but just thinking about the skill a historian has, which is, you know, the process, chronology, change over time, I think that would work wonderful um, if you're having students think about what they need to do first in order to have a cause and effect or something that comes after that. I think that would be very useful for them. I think that that would be a great use of that, and you could use the, the years there, right? You could use, you know, the actual dates and the month and the day and even the time if you wanted to there. I think that'd be a fabulous use of this that you're also having real transparency that comes. And you could put that in your Canvas course very easily. And that could be sort of the access point for them with that iframe. Are there other questions? Nope, that's it right now. Okay. Let's go back. So this is this is you know the Night Lab website. This is where you'll get all of those introductory points to this. You'll have your Google Sheet. Um, that your students can edit, you can edit. One of the ways that I did this using Canvas was I did make the students post it in two places. So I did create a Canvas speed grader assignment where they posted the text, they posted all of these different points, and I'll actually uh, share with you my uh, instruction sheet that I had. That's a very detailed instruction sheet of how they post all of this in there. Um, but I made them post that and then I also made them post it here. So I, I didn't usually grade directly from the timeline sheet, although you could do that. I usually graded from Canvas as well. I think we have another good question that, that works right yeah. here, which is uh, how do you direct students to the content you want them to use? Do you just give them dates and then see what they can find? And I think that there's different ways to do this. Uh, I've always used it as a, if you see something in your reading that you want to know more about, and want to do research, um, that those are the topics that you can get. If not, uh, if it's not in the reading, shoot me an email and, and I can improve it and maybe uh, get you 
to some resources to maybe one resource to kick off. But a, a large part of that is, is them also building the research skills to know what uh, a valid, accurate source is. So they don't just go straight to Wikipedia um, and try to get all their information from there. So that's how I've used it. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Chris now, who we're going to brainstorm some other ways of using TimelineJS, not just as the traditional timeline, um, just because we're running a little bit low on time. So let me share this with you all. Can you see the PowerPoint now, Chris? Yep. All right. You go into presentation mode. So when we were coming up with this, um, this presentation, we wanted to uh, do a little bit more than just what, what, what we've done. So we brainstormed a couple more ideas for the tools that Night Lab has. And so for the timeline, Julia, if you could advance to the next one, you can uh, see that we think that this could be really useful for group projects, uh, not only for traditional timelines, but you can use it as uh, an opportunity to create in-class activities that historicize any concept across any of the disciplines. Uh, Julia already mentioned this, but it can also, and I mentioned this too, it can really be used as study guides for exams. So you can build it into your curriculum as a crowdsource um, way for students to have accurate and screened information that um, you have approved and uh, really help them do better um, on, on their coursework. Another thing that you can do is you can create digital exhibits uh, museum or special collections type uh, assignments. And these, uh, they have a couple examples of this on their website and they're really, really great. And you can also create storyboards. Um, so if you are in a creative writing class, say, and you want students to progress through their story um, and you have some visual element or not, um, you can really use the timeline to help them with that. Uh, there's also this really interesting feature called Story Maps that's newer, newer than uh, Timeline JAS, in which you can put up a, uh, a map, you can upload it, and you can have a giant map that you upload. I think it's up to a gigabyte. And they have this really cool example of Arya's journey in Game of Thrones. So they uploaded a uh, map of Westeros, and then they mapped her journey around Ga uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, I was thinking that this would also be a great thing to map the trek in Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Uh, but you can also think about this in, in different ways. So we're at USU, no Noel Cockett's our president, so you could use it uh, to map where the science of cloning happened. Um, but you could also use it in a biology class if, you're, if you want students to think about the beagle's journey and on the origins of species. Uh, I'm a historian of psychology, so I was thinking, how about Freud's Vienna and the growth of psychoanalysis? There's a lot going on in Vienna itself, lots of different psychoanalysts training and coming and going with him. So you could really map out where all these people live in that intellectual space of Vienna. I think that would be a great thing, again, to have students feel like they have a piece of knowledge that they're giving back to the class that they're creating. But this could also be something that you're using for your own teaching resources and your own teaching tools as well. If you want to have that map that's a visual aid um, along with your lectures and your activities, you could do that too. There's also another feature called Storyline, and this gets at Jolin, where you can tell the story uh, behind the numbers. They have this really great example where they trace real median household income from about 1980 to today. And on that, uh, that chart, you can point uh, information and, and kind of a dot, and you can explain what that number means at that point in time. So they show uh, and, and explain what's happening with the saving and loans crisis in the late 80s. Uh, obviously, there's a dip in real or in real median household income after 9-11, the Great Recession, and, and students can explain what's happening there. Uh, I also thought that in this moment in time, you could use this to explain population trends. Um, but also vaccination use and disease occurrence. Um, you could chart the growth of free range farming over especially the past 40, 50 years. And you could explain, uh, you could have some legal and law cases that have uh, maybe exposed Monsanto or, or uh, and, and things like that. Um, also, you could use this to maybe chart and explain federal uh, funding and STEM from World War II to today. See the growth right after Sputnik, um, for example, and what has, uh, 
been going on with federal spending in STEM for the past 70 years would be another great project. So to access both story maps and storyline, you could still go to timeline.nightlab.com and you would just click on projects and you'll see both storyline and story maps there. It's done by all the same people. And Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are done in very similar ways using Google, Google Sheets and different sorts of interactive tools that way. Yeah, they're both done with uh, Google Sheets and very simple, you know, four or five step directions for these two. So to kind of end this out, both Chris and I have written about using Timeline.js specifically. Um, my piece, Food in the West, Using Timeline.js in the Classroom from AHA Perspectives, includes an instructions packet that I would, uh, you know, if you're interested in using this, you can use it yourself, you know, adapt it, but it also will maybe walks it through you using the process too. So that's available here as well. And you can see Chris's piece from Not Even Pass. But we hope that you'll experiment with Timeline.js, that this will be something that will help your digital teaching toolkit this semester. And I think we are out of time, but we're happy to stick around and answer any questions for a few minutes, if that's okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Julia and Chris. Um, that was amazing. Um, yes, I've seen some of the questions. Of course, the slides and all materials are going to be shared after the conference. Um, so the slides will be posted. The recording of the entire session will be posted as well. Um, so that's definitely going to be made available. Um, I'm just seeing if there are any other questions coming in. It seems like everyone is just thanking you guys. Um, that was a really great presentation. Um, everyone has really enjoyed it. Um, if there are no other questions left for, um, for right now, um, I'm sure um, Julia and Chris will be happy to answer other questions via email as well.